Hey guys, Jeff Francoeur here. Thanks for listening to our content and please like and subscribe. Jeff Francoeur here with Pure Athlete. Before we get to today's guest, I want to share with everyone that we have uh, our first partnership with Booster. Now, Booster is the high school sports number one athletic fundraising for teams and groups, and uh, their owner and CEO is a good buddy of mine, go to church with him, and a great guy, and instead of me telling you what it is, I'm going to bring him on, so Chris Carneal, thanks for joining us. Jeff, thanks so much. So excited to sponsor Pure Athlete. Love your message, love your vision, love the heart and the values behind it. I'm a former college athlete. I'm a coach of my boys and my daughters as well, basketball and baseball. And our company I started 20 years ago, we work with schools, K through 12, and we serve them by raising funds. The past 20 years, we've raised schools, teams, and groups over $600 million, and we want to continue to serve more schools. So if you're interested in hearing how we can come to your sports team, uh, your school, or your group, uh, choosebooster.com. Again, go to choosebooster.com. Chris, thanks for being a part of this. A big supporter of youth athletics, high school athletics, and we're looking forward to a good partnership with you, man. Absolutely. Love what you guys are doing. Look forward to serving and uh, helping schools raise funds. Welcome back to Pure Athlete. I'm Jeff Francoeur in Philadelphia, still doing the NLCS. Uh, back in studio are Britt and Brad, and I'm so excited about today's guest, guys. She was a four-time All-American at Stanford, two-time World Cup champ, Olymp Olympic medalist, and of course, how I've gotten to know her a little bit in the broadcast field now. And I will tell you, she's going to get her trophy. She beat me. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> she beat me. We had a TBS day where all the talent came in, and she beat me in baseball, my own sport. Yes. And not only beat me, she crushed me. Julie Fowdy, thank you for joining us. I have it right on like the mantle of the fireplace, so the kids can see it. I don't have I'm any. Never... I don't have any other memorabilia. Up. This is it. My, oh my, gosh. My tech Jeff, I'm, I'm proud of you for bringing bringing that up, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know and what? Starting I starting with it, Jeff. Big moment. She, she had a pretty. It. She had a pretty swing. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm thinking she could have played played softball too. Oh, I played a little softball back in the day, but uh, but first <laughs> off, just. Uh, Julie, tell our listeners kind of what you're up to these days. I know you got two old uh, kids in high school and kind of what they're doing. Um, I do. I have two teenagers, a 14 and a 16 year old girl boy, full set. Stop there. Um, I am um, calling U.S. games. I have my own podcast, Laughter Permitted. Um, I do. Uh, it's it's kind of the best of both worlds. I do uh, my soccer stuff with Turner Sports, where is where I got to meet you, Jeff. Um, and then I also do some uh, non-soccer stuff for ESPN and NBC. And um, yeah, so it's it's good right now. Like the fall is a lot of games. U.S. plays a lot of games. I do all the women's game, a couple men's games. Um, so going to be hitting the road again. I spend a lot of time on the summer on the road. So I like to be home in the fall, but that never happens. You know that you know that how that works. Um, but yeah, it's it's good. I live in Southern California, so I get to play a lot of beach volleyball, pickleball run around. Good life. Hey, Julie, you, you do a little bit of cardboard box racing down <laughs> for little league world series. Yeah. 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 Um, I know little league world series is something I've been covering for like the last five years and it's just so much fun. It's like this, this, uh, we always call it like a County fair and there was a baseball game that breaks out, you know, I'll, wait, what are we doing here? I thought we were here covering a County fair. Um, it's just like this great atmosphere and they let, they literally are like, go have fun. I'm like, what? Are you sure that's okay? Yeah. Go talk to the parents, go have fun. And, and so our, our telecasts for the little league world series are just so much fun. Williamsport is a great little town. It's awesome. Yeah. I love, I love watching that. I, all the players, I think all the athletes in any sport watch that. Cause it's just so cool at that age. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's fun. And everyone has their memories of, you know, at that age. And it, and it honestly, I mean, you guys know youth sports well is it's, it's like the, one of the few things that really feels like it's kind of kept that, that innocence and that purity and that joy. And they're really, they're really intentional about it actually, which I love the little league, um, group and in terms of wanting to honor that and cherish that and keep that and as hard as it is today in today's youth sports environment to keep that there really is a sense of joy and um i mean kids will lose and then the other team's coming over and hugging them and you know you're like oh my god that never happens anymore i love this no so that's what i love about it well before we get in and jump right in i want to ask you because obviously you were very young when you were on the national team and able to make that jump. But what is one of your favorite youth sports moment, maybe even earlier from them when you were, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old that you can remember? Oh, favorite youth sports moment. Um, I played for the Mighty Green Machine Soccerettes in soccer for 10 years. Okay, again, who does that anymore? So 10 years I played on this little green soccer team that was basically made up of kids from like about 15 mile radius. And, um, and now, you know, it's like kids drive an hour for practice. I'm like, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Um, but back then, you know, it was all the local kids and we had this really good soccer team. And, um, I I think honestly that, and that team, uh, literally called the soccer ets, um, is still like, you know, a team that like the parents all still know each other. You know, I don't talk to all the soccerettes a lot, but still I, you know, I have all these women who have gone on. Heather Cox works for NBC and does sideline for them. I mean, and all these great women that um, I played with, Elaine Young's played Olympic for volleyball, like that we all grew up together. So that's, I mean, that is the gift of of sports is maybe not just one moment as you have this, you know, these these women who are still teammates that we're soccerettes together. And whenever we get together, we sing, then then, then nobody messes with the green machine. (laughs) That's awesome. Julie, what what other sports you talked a little bit about, what other sports did you play growing up? And and when did you really start focusing on soccer? I played everything. I played tackle football. Honestly, I played, um, I played uh, softball, Bobby Sox till eighth grade. I played uh, volleyball. I played basketball. Um, I ran track and field at, in, at high school. I played volleyball in high school. I did everything. And I, and I wish you could still do that. You can't, it's, they don't make it easy. Um, I mean, some people still try. I tried with my daughter who's 16 now and about killed her her freshman year of high school. Cause it was so much with school. And it's like, it ends up being like four teams when you add the high school component in. So, um, but yeah, I played everything. It wasn't until I got to Stanford that I actually just started playing soccer. Um, and I, and I do think, you know, because I was so diversified, I think it helped a ton. It helped me stay fresh. It helped me not be injured. I would find myself at the end of volleyball season, like juggling the volleyballs with my feet. The coach would be screaming at me, Fowdy, this isn't soccer, but it was like, oh, I wanted to get back out there, you know? And, um, I actually stopped playing soccer one season to play volleyball because I love volleyball so much. So it's just, you can't do that anymore. You know, like it's just, the model is so different, sadly. And I do think it, um, it, it hurts kids in terms of more injuries, more mental fatigue, more burnout, um, more pressure, obviously to specialize early, which I don't recommend, but there does get a point where it's really hard to play multiple sports because there's just not enough days. I mean, time, not not enough hours in the day. Talk, tell us a little bit about the tackle football before we move forward. Like what, you know, what (laughs) position did you play? And you know, were you uh, you a two way player or what? I got the little, I got the little giants in my head right now. Just thinking of you out there. You know, now with flag football for women, for girls, like how popular it is. I'm like, Oh, I would have totally eaten that up. That's so great to see that. Um, I, uh, I was like, you know, my, I I was the, the fourth of four kids, two older brothers and an older sister. And literally like, you know, all my older brother's friends, uh, called me Jimmy. I was such a tomboy, not Julie. So I was little Jimmy and, uh, and I was just a little, like, you know, get me in the dirt. You know, I literally walk around without my top on. (laughs) It's like a little, like pure tomboy when I was like, you know, six, seven. Um, and, 
uh, and they they just thought that was hysterical. And so I did. I played a lot of like I love football. I just love getting dirty. I loved you know I love sports. I was definitely a tomboy. So um, that was like in my early elementary school days. And then I got exposed to soccer from a, a boy at, in elementary school, and we started playing that more. But um, I did. I love playing everything. So it was fun. When you started playing soccer, I mean, I know you said you played all these other sports. When you played another sport, did you completely take a break from soccer or did you keep keep doing some soccer along the way? Well, you, you had kind of defined seasons back then. So you, soccer was fall and, you know, spring and you had summer and winter off and you didn't, because they weren't charging you so much money, you didn't have to train year round, right? I mean, I, it, this pay to play model is problematic because they charge so much, they feel like they need to train year round. Plus they want to keep charging you. So they have to keep training and they uh, can, you know, keep their coaches year round. So, you know, you'd literally shut it down for the summer. There was no summer ball. Um, and so I'd do other things and you'd shut it down for the winter and I'd go do every, other things. So I would be playing pickup with, you know, the kids in the neighborhood at the school or at recess, but no, you didn't, you didn't, you know, you could kind of stop soccer and start volleyball and then you'd stop volleyball and you'd start, you know, softball or whatever it was. Um, but you don't again, see that anymore, sadly. As you were growing up, Julie, what was, did you always excel in soccer more than the other sports or was it, was it, you know, were you a better volleyball player earlier on? Uh, no, I probably always did excel in soccer. I mean, I'd like to think I was a really good volleyball player, but I'm five foot five and three quarters. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm playing against like Bev Odin who played for the USA Olympic team. Who's like six, four. Um, and I'm like, yeah, no, probably not my sport. Um, so I think, um, I just love the diversity of it, but I think I knew, actually, I did not know. I didn't know that I actually could you know, play at a high level in soccer. There was, there was no recognition of that until I actually made a youth national team one summer. And it just kept like getting selected, getting selected. And that was when I was 16. And all of a sudden I just kept getting selected to these teams. And I was like, wait, what? I'm on the youth national team all of a sudden. How did that happen? I was like playing for my little soccerettes and now I'm on the youth national team. So I didn't know, but I knew that I loved it probably the most. And I spent the most time on my own with the ball and messing around and, you know, kicking against the garage door. So I was very self-driven for soccer. Um, and yet I loved all the other sports, but I found myself spending most of my time doing soccer stuff. I'm curious as an, as an adult soccer player, you're an unbelievable midfielder. Were you always a midfielder or did you play other positions growing up? They tried to put me at center back once on the national team against the Dutch. We were playing in the Netherlands. And I said, this is a terrible idea. Anson Dorrance, who was our coach at the time. And they scored four goals on us. Cause I have no pace, right? I'm, I'm quick in like five, 10 yards, but like over distance as a center back, you got to have some pace to stay with those fast forwards. And I was like, this is a bad idea. I'm just telling you right now, I don't defend. I, I don't have pace. Those two are not good combinations for that back line. And then at halftime, he was like, okay, you were right. Go back into midfield. But I would play up top sometimes. I wasn't a great finisher. So it ended up like a lot of times I would end up in the center of midfield. It would hide my pace a little bit and I could I was good on the ball and I could direct from there. So mostly midfield for sure. So Julie, when you were finding yourself on these national teams, probably at the same time you're you're starting to get some interest from colleges. Um, were you thinking both at the same time? Were you thinking like I'm gonna kinda end this in college? Or were you thinking once you started playing for those teams, did you had a shot of playing in the World Cup or playing, you know, in the Olympics or things like were you were you that far out focused or were you kind of just at the moment thinking that year? I, yeah, I don't I don't remember being that locked in, really. I, I mean, I just kind of was playing and and having fun. And and you know, back then, I mean, this is the nineties, there wasn't there wasn't a real recognition of even a U.S. women's national team or there wasn't a World Cup at the time. There wasn't an Olympics. And so there was nothing we were watching on television. There was nothing you were reading about much. So it's very different than today where you're watching World Cups and you're watching them in the Olympics and girls grew up knowing these players. There was no team to kind of admire as you were growing up, which um, 
was interesting because it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to be this one day. You know, I was just like, this is awesome. I'm going to play and have fun. And I don't know where it's going to lead. And, uh, you know, I obviously got to play at Stanford, but um, it that's why it was kind of a surprise that one summer when I was 16, where all of a sudden I'm playing on a youth national team and I got pulled up to the full national team that same summer. And then I got on the national team really young um, when it was really in its early stages of, of formation. So we were, as, as Billie Jean King tells me, the first gen, the first generation, as she was in tennis, she's like, you old bags are the first gen in soccer. So, um, you know, that's, that's uh, where you, you know, you get to kind of set the standard for the program, which was fun. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way. Let me ask you this. Uh, so I, I'm curious when we talk about, you know, you make a good point, Julian, the fact that it's tough to play four or five sports today with the schedules, the travel, everything. How do you fight back, though, and the 12-year-old, you know, my daughter, for instance, when you tell her, you know, look, we want you to play multiple sports, but yet I'm sure you know at the soccer level, too, they're pushing a narrative that you got to travel. You need to play in this tournament. You need to play in this tournament. You know, how do you fight back against that and tell them you don't have to go that route? Yeah. It, you you have to, as a parent, I think, be really strong to say, hey, guess what? We don't need to be at that tournament. Hey, guess what? We don't need to play year round. And what's going to serve you better right now in that development, especially at 12, is that you're going to try other things. And those other things are going to make you actually better in, in soccer, right? If you're not playing soccer because you're going to develop a hand-eye coordination through volleyball. I think that helped me a lot. Um, and it's it's not the same repetitive motion on your body all year year long, which for young kids can be a lot. You know, you see some huge injuries early on. And I'm like, what are we doing? Like, you don't have to go to every tournament. And as hard as that is as a parent, because you have this peer pressure from other parents, like, oh, I've got to play on this team. I got to play at this level. And we got to go to a gold team. This, this team's not good enough. I, I actually kept my kid in a local team. I have a soccer player, the 16 year old's a soccer player. And I kept her with our local team until she was like 14, which is late. And it was like not a very high level. And she begged me to take her off this team in the end, but I loved it. It was like five minutes away for practice. I love the parents, good team chemistry. I'm like, this is great. No, we're not going on to this next, you know, this, this den, this lion's den that's going to eat you alive at this next level. So she, was the one who was like, no, mom, it's time. I got to get to this next level. Um, but you have to, as parents, I think, be really strong about, no, we're gut we don't need to go to everything and, and resist that, that peer pressure, that parental pressure, that coaches pressure, and hopefully get with a coach. I mean, there, there are a few out there, not many, there are a few out there that will be like, yeah, we want you to play multiple sports. We're okay with you missing this tournament. Um, the problem arises when you get coaches who are like, you have to be at everything. You need to show up to show you're committed. And then it becomes a really hard, but we, we just try to avoid that type of program altogether and play at the highest level we could, but like with a coach and a program that understood the value of diversifying and they're out there. You can find them sadly. But So Julie, I'm curious, does your daughter have aspirations to play beyond high school? Yes, she does. She wants to play in college. She wants to play D1. So I have that conversation a lot. I'm in the middle of it. She's a junior. It's a lot. I'm like, I mean, it, I mean, there's so many schools out there too. I'm like, what about D2? What about D3? Like, does it have to be D1? You know, these kids though, they were like wired, like I, I got to play D1. She, she has the self-recognition to realize like, I'm probably, I'm not good enough for like a, a D1 Stanford, UCLA, like a top, top program. But she, I think she could play D1 somewhere in like a middle tier, bottom tier program. So we try and kind of be realistic and say, okay, I let her really drive it, try and see as many schools as we can. Um, and she plays at the top level with a really good team. So that helps. But um, yeah, it's hard because, you know, she's, she's a junior and they start committing their junior year. And so now all these kids, you know, another thing we didn't have was this social media influence, right? Of all these kids going, I'm committed. I'm going to UCLA. I'm going to Stanford. And she's not committed yet. And I thought, oh gosh, how is she going to react to this? Right. But I'm, I'm like, patience, you got to see these schools. You can't just jump at the first one. Right. And so she's actually been really good with it. And I don't, I don't, I, which I'm pleased with, you know, she says like, no, I'm good. I don't, 
I don't feel any pressure yet. And, um, but yeah, you have a lot of kids that feel that pressure and I get it. I mean, we never had that comparison to look at, right. We didn't know. Um, so yeah, it's just a, it's a whole different animal transfer portals, all that. You guys know that stuff. It's so different. I, I'm curious, Julie, talking about parenting, what, what were you, I know the environment was different, but what were your parents like as sports parents? How did they manage all that for you? <laughs> Great, great question. My parents were um, so chill. I mean, like, it didn't even come to games. It was like, I was the fourth kid, right? I mean, like, when I I left for school, they were like, peace out. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, they're like kicking me out the door. Like, yes! I, I mean, just uh, Judy and Jim. I call them Slim Jim and Fruity Judy because they were just so chill. Like, super supportive and like, yes, you can do whatever you want, open doors. But like, you know, they, I had to convince my dad to come to the first women's world cup, like the world cup for the United States national team back in 1991. He was like, honey, that's a busy time for me. I don't know if I can come. I was like, dad, it's like, this is kind of, he's like, what is a world cup? I don't even know. <laughs> I mean, it's so clueless. Um, but you know, the, the, the the lesson in that is that I say to my husband all the time, like, we don't have to show up at every game. Like, let them play because they want to play, not because we're on the sidelines cheering and screaming and, um, and you know, and because we're there watching. And so I I think with the best of intentions, we – we uh we're really good as parents in this generation of sucking the joy out of it because we're always present and we're there for you. We got your water, we got everything. And it's like, no, back off a little bit and let them play and just enjoy it on their own and figure out what, you know, what. So I I literally like when I'm traveling on the road, I used to be like, "Oh, I'm sad I'm missing." I'm like, "No, you know what? It's actually good. It's okay. I don't want to miss a lot, but like, you know, it's good that they have moments where they're just playing and it's not all about the, you know, the parent involved and all that. My parents were the best example of that. Instead of the parent. Yeah. 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 And at a certain age, they probably prefer you not being there. <laughs> They'd rather hang with their friends. <laughs> I know mine are like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I've spent a lot of time in my broadcasting career asking young kids, whether it's little league or, you know, soccer, like what, what advice would you give parents? And, you know, the, the number one advice, right? just shut up. <laughs> just sit there. Don't, don't say anything. Like just, just be quiet, you know? So my whole thing, my whole rule is like, I never cheer for my kid. I only, if I cheer, it's like, it's a team thing. Right. You know, like, it goes, all right, slammers, let's go. But never like for, you know, my daughter or my son. So. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. You know, my son's playing lacrosse this year and I know nothing about lacrosse. I mean, I am learning it. And it's been so oh, much wow. fun to actually sit and just watch it's it's yeah. been awesome yeah lacrosse is hard i still don't i know same i have some dear friends that coach and play and they tried to like map it out for me and i'm like no i i, I still don't quite jeff could you explain yeah, it to her can fun. you give us a kind of a one minute you know kind of <laughs> <laughs> yeah jeff I, can you i know this that there's <laughs> offense defense and there's midfielders that can do both ways <laughs> And I know that you can you can check each other. I know that there's some good physicalness in uh, oh, yeah. in lacrosse. Like, you can whack each other. You have pads. Well, the men's side, the boys' side, right? The gal yeah. side, I don't think you can you can check as much. But the guys, I'm like, why wouldn't a young boy want to play this? You can whack the hell out of each other with a with a racket, with a stick. Of course, they're going to want to play. When um, well, I was just going to ask. You know, we we've had great guest on here. Davey Pollock always said something that kind of resonate with me that you don't really know what your kid has until they go through puberty and really come out the other <laughs> side, which is so true. But just curious for you, like growing up, did, did you hit a big growth spurt at a certain age or where all of a sudden you just became so much faster? I'm just curious. That's so funny because this is my 14 year old boy right now who complains that why did he have to have two soccer players as his parents? And so he wants I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I only went to, you know, four Olympics, four World Cups. Like, yeah, no, mom. What, mom, why didn't you, why couldn't you have been a volleyball? Because he's tall. He wants to be tall. He's a basketball player. He's not a soccer player. Why couldn't you have been a volleyball or a basketball player? I mean, look at all these parents that are six foot five. And I've got a 5'11 and 5'6 parent. I'm like, dude, 
<laughs> Stop. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's great. He he's like, hey, I gotta sleep. I gotta grow. I got two short parents. <laughs> when I I wake him up at like noon, he's like, let me go back to sleep. I gotta grow. Remember? Uh, so uh, yeah, I have this conversation with my my fourteen year old son. Um, I I I never really had that growth spurt. Sadly, I was always kind of five 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 six. Uh, my husband's about six foot. He says six foot. I think it's more like five eleven in heels. Um, and then, you know, my but my son is like six one already, and he's only fourteen. So, and he's a good little basketball player. I don't know. I I do think, um, you know, you see, and especially in with boys, like you know, they're so late in their development, and you get these kids that Declan has grown up with who are all of a sudden just, you know, at 15, just sprouting or they're late, late bloomers. And then all of a sudden they're sprouting late in high school. So um, I did not have that sudden burst of, of uh, it. And for women too, I think it's different. Like puberty hits women very differently. All of a sudden, you know, maybe you've got hips and, and you've got a chest and uh, you know, you've got a period and it's very, you know, it's it, it, it your body's totally changing, which is, um, an adjustment for a lot of young, young gals. Hey, Julie, you've been, you know, a big champion for, for young girls sports and, uh, and you've done a whole bunch of stuff. And I want to talk about some of that for a couple of minutes. You have this leadership girls sports leadership Academy. Can you kind of tell us what your vision is or was for that? And, mm -hmm. you know, how do you, how do you develop that? What are the goals there? Yeah. So that started when I retired from playing because I had been doing just a soccer camp forever. And I was like, shoot me now if, if I'm just teaching a kid how to kick a soccer ball and that's it. Like the whole beauty and gift of sports is that it's all about these, you know, lessons we're learning about taking care of each other, being a good teammate, you know, working hard, good discipline, all these things we learn, obviously, as, as we all have from playing. And I just felt like for young girls, there's still even like the, the most confident, you know, athletes out there, there's this hesitation for young girls they are a little bit, um, uh, and still today, uh, unwilling to get out of their comfort zone or raise their hand or speak up or, you know, uh, you know, act differently and, and out of the norm, you know, for fear of being, you know, a spotlight on them. And so the idea came from like, could we do something for girls that actually talked about how sports is this great vehicle for leadership? So half the day we spend playing sports, the other half we spend on um, hands-on fun activities that are all about leadership. And we've been doing it, gosh, for almost like two decades, like 20 years. Um, and the whole idea is they go back into their communities and they come up with some, I'm a big believer in leadership being service. And it's not that you have to raise millions of dollars or be a superstar or, you know, win medals at any level. Like you just have to care enough to raise your hand and, and speak up and stand up and, and do things for your community. And couldn't we, we could teach every girl that we could teach every kid that like plant that seed early. I never got that until I, you know, was later in life. And so that's, kind of the premise of what we do. And, um, it's just been so much fun. It's been a labor of love, uh, that we do it every year. We've had, you know, thousands of kids come through it and still, you know, to this day, they've started foundations, they're doing service work, they're, they're leading and, you know, so many different areas. So it's been really fun. Julie, when you, uh, look back on that iconic 1999 team, you're a part of, and kind of what you guys, uh, did for women's sports. And now you see, what happened at Nebraska at that volleyball match yeah, in Nebraska where they had 80,000 and they just had, I think 60 something thousand at a Iowa basketball game I here recently. Yeah. I mean, how does that make, I mean, how does that make you feel? And, and yeah. what do you think, what do you think the, the tipping point was it 1999? What was the tipping point where, where women's sports from a fan standpoint kind of got that, got that attention that was needed? Yeah. It's a great question because we used to think, well, gosh, 99 will be the tipping point, right? But now what are we, 20, 25 years out from that? And we're like, oh, finally, that tipping point has been realized. So it took another two decades. And um, and it's great. Uh, we call ourselves the OB, the old bags, for us to see uh, that this is actually taking hold because um, we had been saying that 20 years ago, right? Like, we know that there's, there's interest. We know there's a fan base and yet um, I don't think society was quite ready for it in, in the nineties and early two thousands. And now you're seeing, I mean, 
just women's sports exploding, of course, and you're seeing sponsorship revenue and hopefully media rights will follow, which is another big frontier that um, they're working on right now. But um, I mean, I'm part of, uh, actually, I have my hat on right now, Angel City, which is uh, one of the pro teams in the women's pro league in LA. And um, you know, we all got in, I'm an owner with that group. We all got in, there was a valuation. I think the team was valued at 3 million. I think it just got valued at like 180 million. Um, it, it is all celebrities and, uh, past players and, um, a lot of women, majority women led and run and, um, and owned. And so it's, it just feels like, um, people's, and, and the data started, you know, we started to aggregate the data rather than just anecdotal stories of, no, the people are watching. And ESPN, when you put it on in prime time and on a linear channel where they can watch it, they'll watch. You know, we're seeing ABC's numbers crush it. NBC, of course, CBS, when they put it on linear and in big time slots, they're doing great. So um, I'm super pleased. I just was with Billie Jean King, actually, this past week. Um, talking a lot about this too. And like, I mean, just her impact and her, she's the thread that runs through all of that for her to see this, you know, she's almost 80 years old. She turns 80 in in a couple of weeks Um, for her to see the impact she's had on, on this world um, is, is so fun to see because she's, she really has been the godmother of all of this. Yeah. She was so great. I see her all the time at Dodgers stadium. <clears throat> she's a huge yeah. Dodgers fan when you go out there. Yeah. She was not happy about the Dodgers. She's like, I don't want to talk about the Dodgers. I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> For sure. Speaking of the 99 team, I know a lot of our listeners would love to know what is your favorite game you ever played in? Oh, I know you've played in a lot um, of great ones. I, I mean, it, if it was, it probably, I mean, obviously 99 was so special because no one thought we could pull that off and then we end up winning it and then Brandy gets naked and uh, that picture becomes iconic. <laughs> uh, I'm just happy. I was next, by the way, and I was like, yeah, no one needs to see that belly. So thank God it was her. Um, so uh, oh, uh, the, actually probably my favorite game was um, the 2004 Olympics. It was my last game, like competitive game with the national team. And it was the Olympics uh, in Greece. And um, we had lost the prior World Cup. We had lost the prior Olympics. And so it was our last, like Mia was retiring as well. I was retiring. Joy Foster was retiring. That older, the OBs, the old, the, the old bags were retiring. And we <laughs> knew, I said to my husband, honey, if we don't win this, like I could be a, a, a B.I., TCH for the rest of my life. Like, and you're going to, and you're going to be married to that. I, I, so you better start praying that we win this Olympics. Um, and, um, and we ended up in 2004 winning that Olympics and really we're, we didn't have the best team. We played Brazil in the final and they had a great team and we just ended up gutting it out. So I think that's probably because it was the last game and it was the end of our career, but that was probably the, the moment and and just like like we purely gutted it out and so that I always took a ton of pride in. And your and your husband got a happy yeah, year yeah. for Thank the rest God. the rest of time. He was like, please God, <laughs> everyone, start doing what you can to make sure they're successful. You guys, uh, you, you guys put the U.S. women's team on such a great trajectory, but we'd be remiss if we didn't ask you know your take on the most recent world cup and, and, uh, and what, what happened there from your perspective and what's the future look like? Yeah. Is what I think of that last world cup. Uh, yeah, that was frustrating. I just had one of the players on my podcast, Lynn Williams, and she's like, it was confusing. I don't know what happened. I was like, confusing, disappointing. What adjectives do we want to use sadly? And I think, um, I, I think the reality is, is that the world is, is really good now in women's soccer. We always had the advantage of title nine and so many girls playing in this country. I mean, we have millions, 4 million girls playing. And so we had the volume, whereas these other countries who maybe had the culture of soccer in their country. And so they grew up watching it, but it was mostly for men. um, They're now supporting women. They're funding women. They've got teams they're playing. So that this, I think it's going to be very difficult actually for the U S team in the future 
they'll always be competing, but it's never going to be like it was where we, you know, we have four world cups out of eight. Um, it's going to be a very different animal, which it should be. And it's good, but yeah, that was, that was a, that was a hard one to watch. Um, but we'll, we'll always, we'll always be in the mix. It's, and I think it's a good thing that, you know, th these other programs are getting funded and supported in ways that for a long time we've, you know, advocated for. Julie, what, I mean, can you compare winning a world cup with, with winning a gold medal in the Olympics? I mean, you, you basically have always, uh, I know yeah. people ask me this all the time. You always have, you always it's have hard. the Trump card at every dinner party. I mean, just like, I would love to walk in and do yeah. I mean, two truths <laughs> and a lie. You're going to win that every time, you know, but uh, can you compare those two? <laughs> Um, you know, it, there, I, yeah, people always say what's better. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't know. It's hard. I mean, world cup is just soccer. So it's kind of like the pinnacle of your sport, but there's something really magical to Olympics. Like when you're in the Olympic village and you're walking around and there's just, you know, flags and countries and everyone's coming through with their gear on and so many different sports. I mean, there's nothing like it. It's so cool. Um, so the Olympic golds, and even we have, I call it a white gold. We, we lost in 2000, uh, to darn Norway, um, is, is something really special as well. And there's, you know, there's just, it, it's like the world stops too, you know, in those moments when you have the Olympics, it's like this, this, this brief period where it does feel like people are stopping for good reasons and you're coming together to celebrate all these athletes and all they're doing. So, um, yeah, it's really cool. I I uh I do have occasionally friends who come over and and seek out the medals, and all of a sudden we'll be in the middle of a party and they're walking around <laughs> with medals on. I'm like, what are you do what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, you know, people are like, I've got them in my safe or on a wall. I'm like, no, they're in my underwear drawer. That's the safest place. No one wants to go there. <laughs> Hey, Julie, I want to jump back into, into young women for a, a moment and youth, youth sports and some of the issues. And you've, you've got a teenage daughter, um, you're involved in youth sports and mental health today is such a big issue. And, uh, with the, with the amount of pressure there is now on performing, not just in sports, but in every facet of life and social media and so on and so forth, you know, how do we, how do we help our daughters uh, adjust and adapt and handle all this, you know, as parents? Yeah, I know. And it, it's, I think talking about it first and foremost is, is the most important thing. I'm constantly checking in um, with my daughter, with my son. Um, and as much as we can, like, just, I'll give you an example. Uh, this past weekend, um, Izzy plays for a top level soccer team. And as I was telling you, right, she really wants to get into college and play. And she had her homecoming and she's missed a couple of her homecoming because of soccer. And she really wanted to go. And I said, well, then go, go to homecoming, miss your game. It's not a big deal. It's one game. They're going to be fine. They've got all these players. It's not like you're short on subs, right? You're going to be fine. Like, just don't lie to your coach, call your coach and say, I'm conflicted. I really want to go to homecoming because I haven't been. And what do you think? And I said, and he's going to get it because he's super reasonable. And I said, but do not lie to him. She wanted to lie. Like, oh, I'm going to make up. I have no, 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 no lying. Cause that will always come back to bite you. But like have that balance. And I think we as parents really have to, because they're feeling a lot of stress of like, I got to be at everything. I got to be the top of everything. I got to, you know, I got to prove this. It's like, no, you don't have to. And, and even with school, we, we had a really good talk with a counselor when Izzy started her freshman year, she was in all honors, all AP dual immersion. She speaks Spanish as well. Two sports, right? Two club sports. So she's playing literally on four teams. And like, she just was like, pounded into the ground and had some major mental health issues. And, and the woman helped us. She said, why, why do you have her in all this? I'm like, I didn't put her in any of this. This is what the school gave her. I didn't even know. Right. Like I wouldn't have done that. She's like, take her out of, you don't have to be in 700 honors classes. I've seen all these kids who they want to do every honors, every AP. And in the end, they're miserable after four years of high school, they have depression, they have all these mental health issues. Like, 
to back off. So I think as much as we want to push them, we have to also back off, back off. I mean, because we over push. And so that's been my mantra with her is, you know, take one honors class and one AP class, right? You don't have to be in seven honors classes. Back off of, if you want to just play one sport, play one sport. Cause I was really pushing multiple sports. She's like, it's too much. So now she's just soccer. If you want to go to homecoming, go to homecoming. And I think we, as parents direct that. So she went to homecoming. She called the coach. She had the conversation. He was awesome. She was at practice last night. And I said, how was he? She was amazing. I said, you feel good about it? She said, yeah. And now she wants to play because she got to go do that other balanced part yeah. of her life. She got to be with her friends. She have that, have that social element. I mean, we don't want to look back and go, why did I miss all these things? And that was for what? I, and I was miserable. Like balance, balance, mm -hmm. balance. As much as we can promote that as parents. Such a key message. It's great. Man, I love that. I'm so glad she went to homecoming. Uh, I, I just think that's a great, Me too. you know, we, we talk about the, the yeah. pressure to these kids to do more, more, more. And, you know, we, the whole idea of when we did this podcast, Julie, was we want these kids to have a great time playing sports, to develop relationships, yeah. become good teammates, become good people. You know, Jay Billis came on with us and he was like 96 point something percent of kids don't ever play sports past high school. They're done. And so why are we not giving these kids yeah. the opportunity to have a great time? And I think it's so cool. Yes, some people might turn out to be like you where you get to go on to World Cup. But majority are going to play through high school yeah. and go on to college and enjoy life. So, you know what? Good for you for saying that to your daughter. And I think teaching her lesson, too, for her to you got to tell them the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Do not lie. God, that no. never gets you anywhere. Yep. Right. Like they're going to find out. They're going to see the <laughs> yeah, pictures you exactly. posted of you at homecoming. Hello. I'm like, what? No. What are you doing? No. But it's also a little reminder if you're a coach listening, because she's had coaches who like punish kids for going to homecoming or for, you know, and I'm like, really? Like, couldn't that at least be a conversation? Mm. Like, okay, if that's important to you, tell me why. And let's talk about it. Like, how many subs do we have? Can we make it work as a team? Like, at least be a conversation. And it shouldn't be like the first reaction of a coach is, how dare you for wanting to be a kid and go to homecoming, right? You're not dedicated enough. So um, I hope that we have some coaches that can actually have that perspective as well. Because right now I'm seeing that there's a lot that, that, that trend to the other side. Amen. Well, finishing up, we appreciate your time. La last last question for you. I want all the young women and young men that are going to be watching this podcast. What what's your last message to them about just growing up and playing sports? Hunt the joy. Find the joy, whatever it is in the sport, the team, the friends. Like in, unless there's joy in what you're doing, then, I mean, that was my driver and everything. I wanted to be out there because I was having fun. I wanted to be out there because I was with my friends. I wanted to be on the road because I got to hang out with my friends. Like the teammates you make, the, the, the life lessons you learn are fantastic, but you got to love it. And so whether you're a parent, a coach, a player, like all of us need to contribute to that being a joyful experience. And whatever you, when you're, when you're thinking about as a parent or a coach or a player, what's the right move? Like, let that be your guiding, your guiding compass, because I think good things happen when we're having fun and enjoying it and loving it. And, and, uh, and that's not just sports as we know, right? That's everything in life. So. Well, Julie, thank you for being a role model for, for your leadership program, what you do. It's so inspiring. And uh, no, if, if we so. have the Techwood Cup next year, I'm going to get my revenge on you. I'm going to work <laughs> on, I'm going to start working on my baseball <laughs> swing again. I guess I got to do that. God. I mean, boys, it was, it was like, Jeff, come on, man. Like you cannot, you cannot be whipping yeah, like that, Jeff. You call yourself a major yeah. league baseball player. And he's a Jeff. sore loser too. That, that setup. <laughs> That setup was the coolest thing I've never seen. It's a, um, have you guys seen this? It's like a, I, get, I was like, I got yeah. this for a party. The air blows a little backyard. wiffle ball. It's like an yeah. air. Yeah. The wiffle ball like hangs in the air. Have you seen it? With oh, the air man. blowing it up. I hadn't either. And, but it, it, it kind of bobs around because the air is like underneath it and it's just floating. And so you have was to. Was it like a slider, of, Jeff? It was it like well, a slider. Is that why you just I'm hitting it? Well, and that's kind of the unfair thing is that the soccer part of it, 
the ball was sitting still. You can kick it no matter what, right? So you're not going to look here's like a pro, an idiot. Here's a pro jazz. My sport, it looked like an idiot because the ball was floating up and down. And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> I didn't. I no, didn't yeah, just own it, Jeff. Just own it. You got to own it, Jeff. Yeah, I, I will Whatever. tell you. What are JF? The, be- the best was when Ernie was like, you would think – one JF actually would have won this award, but it was the he, other JF that won it. That's how he introduced her, and now I'm just I'm going to sit here and wear it for another year. That's right. That's well, right. we can't wait to we can't wait to listen to you. And uh, again, thank you so much for coming on with us today. No worries. Thank Thanks for doing this uh, podcast. It matters. Thank you, Julie, so much. All right. Bye. See you guys. Care. Hey guys, Jeff Francoeur here. Thanks for checking out Pure Athlete. And subscribe to our channel on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you go to listen to our podcast.